This show is sponsored by Hulu Plus. Hulu Plus the Hulu Plus lets you binge on thousands of hit shows anytime, anywhere on your TV, PC, smartphone, or tablet. Support this podcast and get an extended free trial of Hulu Plus when you go to HuluPlus.com slash Joey. That's HuluPlus.com slash Joey. This show is also sponsored by NatureBox, where you can get where you can order tasty, healthy snacks right to your door. Right to your door! Snack smarter in the new year with healthy and delicious treats like French Toast Granola. Support this podcast and get 50% off your first order. Go to NatureBox.com and use promo code Joey. That's NatureBox.com, promo code Joey. Are you kidding me or what? Oh shit. Oh shit. Wednesday, January 8th. The day the devil was buried at sea. Hit that motherfucker, Lee. What? Uh oh. Oh shit. If you're thinking about getting your dick sucked, today is the day, cocksuckers. What? Uh oh. Listen to this shit. Running with the fucking devil. You understand? We're running with two gods, but we got a little devil. At least I am. He lives his life like there's no tomorrow. You understand? Everything he got, he got to fucking steal. You know what I'm saying? Listen to him. He's dropping it, at least I am. Put your hands up in the air, buddy. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Wiggle, little Uncle Joey. Wednesday, cocksucker. What's the story, dog? There is no story. Running with the devil. Who has to think about getting a, their dick sucked? That's just, I never have to think about it. You the think answer, about it? the answer is always yes. So when you wake up in the morning, you're peeing, and you're fucking all groggy up and shit. What are you thinking about, like? What's going through your head? The honest to God truth. Don't lie to me. Why the fuck am I up? That's always. A, I never want to wake up because I never could sleep late. And I've always been in that, that, but I never th- wake up thinking about getting my dick sucked. I always, it's never, it never stops. I don't know who thinks, like, oh, maybe today I'll get my dick sucked. If, if it's ever an option, the answer is yes. So you, you, you getting your dick sucked is always in the back of your mind. Yeah. Even when you eat McDonald's. Fuck yeah. When you're eating a quarter pounder with cheese sweating up. I went, sweat. I went a while without having sex. So it was always, I was jacking off like twice a day. Fuck yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. You're a savage. <laughs> Fuck know, yeah. When I was like 24. 22 I went on a dry streak for a fucking year yeah and you get close to being creepy like you fucking but the whacking off balances you out sometimes sometimes you bang one out and it brings you back it saves a life it does but then there's the fucking the online dating thing gets creepy and and you meet weird people who do stuff to you and it's just it's not good you hear any more any, from your exes from online dating what are you hearing from those nasty no people? no what about thank that? god you didn't come over and lick your asshole for Christmas and shit <laughs> No one's ever gonna lick an asshole. That's a uh, no, but no, it's a. Uh, the weirdest one was this girl who bit my nipple and it like broke the skin, and that was the weirdest. Did you bleed? Fuck yeah! And she, she thought it was cool, and she, she thought it was, and I would like it, but no, oh, that was the fucking worst. I can't even, can't even explain what else did to, you. She do to you. Nothing. But did she, you fuck her before yeah, she bit your nipple? No, I, I, I after, but she fucking. I ran into a string of girls. I don't know what it was, but something about being attracted to girls who would not give head. Like, just for years, none. I don't like it. I won't do it. I won't like it. I won't do it. And finally, I found one that likes it. But Did you ever propose a left hook? A <laughs> left hook to the... Like, what? the what? fucking ear. How the fuck are you not going <laughs> to suck a dick? No wonder you're single, you dummy. Yeah. So, I, I, I got a, a bunch of... A string of those. That's pretty weird when a girl tells you she won't give head. Like, right away, you look at her... Like, you're like, ugh, this fucking bitch has no longevity. Because after a while, even after you love somebody, even after that, the act of licking your balls is just an act of love, if you really think about it. Yeah, and then it's just... I mean, some people got to pay $22 to... But some people lick your nuts just, you know, because yeah. they love you. Yeah, who, who wouldn't? But, I mean, when you're 18, you walk around with a boner just for having a, bo- a boner, but... I mean, I I don't know about you, but I'm not always walking around with just a boner, just for with a girl I've never met before. So yeah. that testosterone had me fucking fucked up, Lee. Oh really? It, yeah, it really did have me a little fucking horned up. So why would you get off of it? <laughs> I got. Why would I? Yeah. Because it's borderline fucking. I was looking at massage places. Oh uh, okay. I was talking about it, and I even told the Agostino about a week ago. I go, you know this? Since I got off the testosterone, we don't give a fuck about the hookers walking anymore. There's a black hooker in North Hollywood. That is fucking beautiful. Do you understand me? 
She's beautiful. She walks in North Hollywood and in Studio City. She walks by Marie E.T. every fucking day. Mm. Nobody catches it. She wears a wig. She's got a beautiful face, a fucking tremendous body. Me and my wife have driven up on her 20 times in, in, in Studio City. We just laugh. But the beautiful one, don't you think she must be so, like really fucked up if she's that pretty and still is on the street? She is hot and young and... You know, she just probably... Hey, you don't know what the mentality is. You don't know if they have a kid at home. You don't know what the mentality is. Some women... Listen, man, I, I've, I've repeated this a thousand times. When I was 20, I was living in Aspen, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I used to see guys my age, maybe guys 10 years younger than me, come to town and they hook up with a young girl. And I remember one day thinking, you know, what's wrong if with a woman, if one day she goes, look, when you're 22, you, very seldom are women lucky in love. They date knuckleheads, steroid guys. They beat them. They cheat on them. They're fucking whatever. What's the difference? You go out there. You fucking make yourself a highline hooker. If you you can make yourself to be whatever you want to be. Do you understand me? At any level of your life. Uh, for example, for a long time. <coughs> look at that. We're both coughing. <laughs> we're coughing in unison. People were calling me for all these YouTube movies. Okay. For a long time, I was getting up and wearing my own clothes and doing these YouTube videos. All these movies that people were going to sell or whatever. With me, I wanted to work on my acting and I wanted to learn about it. But one day I said, I swear to God, like three years ago, I go, that's it. I ain't doing these no more. They're not getting me anywhere. So I made a mental note. So for years, people hit me up and part of me, I wanted to do them, but I didn't want to do them. And I had to go right back. No, at this time I'm busy. And I lied to a thousand people about it. I made up a job, but I just wanted to get away from that. And look, too big. I got another movie coming out January 14th. Bra Brave Bull, Raging Bull 2, or whatever. Uh, oh, Bull. that's coming out now? Okay. Yeah, that's coming out uh, next week. You know, it's a shit. I don't know if it's a good I don't know. The budget was good. The director was good. I, my scenes were all with uh, Paul. Uh, Vario from Goodfellas. I don't know what his Paul, real name is. He's from Jersey, a big actor who played Paulie in Goodfellas. But I, I made that mental note. I'm not doing these fucking low. SAG made this thing years ago called low budget movies. Yeah. Like, you get fucked in the ass, bro. By the way, you know what my fucking jujitsu teacher told me? What? We were talking the other day about editing. And I go, you know why I think my partner is fucking uh, editing assistant? And he goes, let me tell you something. That's the worst job in the world. Yeah. Is it really? It's. He says at his place now, <clears throat> they torture those guys. They torture us, and it's just, it's it's not an easy job, but there's a ton of us out here because that's the job you get right out of college. So people are taking the low-level paying jobs that fuck people like me over who've been doing it for a few years because the prices go down. So, and then there's the night jobs. It's not the worst job in the world. I mean, I'm, I'd much rather be doing that for a thousand a week than, than digging ditches, but it's not... And it takes about four or five years to start getting editing gigs, so it's 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 not easy. So one day you're gonna wake up one morning and go, "I'm not doing this no more." That's what I did. And you're gonna get different calls. Now people are gonna call you for editing jobs. Hopefully, man. Yeah. You're gonna get off the phone and go, "I don't want to do that." No, I can't. I'm already committed. You're gonna make up lies and want because I'm the type of guy I don't like kicking nothing to the side. If you call me and you go, "I got a job for you for two hundred dollars," I would never want to be homeless. And go, I could have used those $200. Yeah. Because I did that as a kid. I would fucking do blow and blow off jobs and then go, fuck, that guy was going to give me 400 fucking bucks to paint his house and I didn't show up. So I was always one of those guys and I would go, fuck, you know, I could have used that 200 right now. So, yeah. uh, but don't, a, don't you think with the hookers, I mean, maybe w w when it was back then in Colorado it was different, but now with like social media, I don't think, you, I don't think you could ever escape it. I don't think, like, your friend who is in Florida now, who's still a stripper, she kind of, she did it on the, in a town over, and no one will ever find her, but if she started <coughs> now, she'd be on Facebook or something. No, she's, she's on Facebook, but not as a stripper. She's on Facebook as a fucking mommy. But do you think that's still, I, I, I don't, I think She that's, knows how to control it. I think that's the exception. I think the rule now would be eventually in 20 years your kids would somehow find out a video would be on YouTube. Nah, there's ways to hook that. Listen, man, there's ways to hook. If you stand on the corner and you get and you pull over for fucking Puerto Ricans and Cubans and Arabs and black guys, 
That's what you, I'm serious. I'm not putting nobody down, but if you pull over and you're getting your fucking asshole eaten up by fucking, you know, disgusting guys, you know, that's your, your street value. But if one day you wake up, okay, and you put a fucking ad out there, you go help, like, you. eventually you got to meet somebody. So you meet some woman who has a BMW and, and she tells everybody she's a fucking businesswoman. And this woman probably entertains fucking just Arabs that fly in for a thousand a night. She sucks their dick. She takes up the fucking ass. It's a night from hell. But it's a thousand fucking bucks. You do that three nights a week. That's three. That's twelve fucking thousand. Yeah. You know what? You could tell the government you're fucking sewing shirts. Yeah. I mean, I, do you think there's any hookers? How many who... fucking women fucking work their asses off? Single moms. They fucking make us look like fucking faggots, Lee. Do you understand me? Yeah. I tell my wife all the time. I tell a lot of people. You go by Victory and Violent, by that Target, mm -hmm. and you wait 15 minutes. You'll see a Mexican woman walk by with a kid in a stroller and pushing one with groceries by herself. And her fucking man's working two jobs. You understand me? And, and at any time, he might not come home because he's got a no fucking green card. Yeah. So when those motherfuckers leave to work every day, they might not come home. Now a woman, really, what do you think a woman's going to do? Two kids in a foreign fucking country. She's going to have to suck a dick somewhere or... And, I'm, and I shouldn't say something like this, or fucking lift to do something. What are you going to lift to do in this country, in this economy, at this time of your fucking life? Yeah, what, I mean, what are you going to do as a woman that doesn't speak English? Yeah. You got, you got a nice body, you got a cute face. What the fuck are you going to do? Do you think anyone can do that without causing, like, permanent? Like, I just. That's, permanent. That, that's why I don't go to the strip clubs, because I think permanent. they must be fucking. I can't even imagine what's going permanent on in their head. Permanent. Listen, everything you do in your life, somewhere along the line, it's going to come back to fucking bite you in the ass. Yeah. Like, look, at, look at this thing you told me the other day about Tito Ortiz. I didn't Was it you that told me? Yeah. I didn't fucking know about that. Did you see his ex-wife on YouTube two months ago? She oh, was yeah. all over Facebook. All fucked, fucked up. up. Yeah. Dog, and if you hang out with people who are fucked up, who have a lot of luggage. I used to hang out with a girl who had a ton of fucking luggage. And I loved this woman. But it felt like her poison was killing my poison. Her energy was sucking my energy up. So instead of thinking about comedy 100% of the day, I was thinking about comedy 30% of the day because I was thinking about her mm -hmm. and her fucking, and, and I couldn't focus and all her bad luck was falling on me. You know, this chick was like an amateur fucking scam artist. And I accepted it. It was funny. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday and he called me for advice. And he's, I've known this guy for 30 fucking years, but he's the whitest dude in America. That's why I love him. And he's a 40-year-old guy and... He's like everybody else, bro. He's lonely. He's not married. His friends have kids. So he's on the online dating, you know? And yeah. uh, every 90 days he calls me a story. Now he fucks all these broads. They suck his dick. They're crazy on online oh, dating. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're fucking crazy. But uh, this one really got to him because he was with her for 90 days. Everything was going great. They were talking about Valentine's Day, and she sat him down. <laughs> oh, no. And told him that. You know, she cooked meth at one time, and then she stripped, and then she was into threesomes, <laughs> that she fucked a monkey, you know, just dropped it on him, oh, and no. it broke him, it broke him emotionally, Lee. It just, would break me. It just broke him, like, it just swept him, and he said, listen, it's better, I can't deal with this. Every time I see it in the story, he started adding up, the mother did suicide, the sister killed her, it was just one after the other, and he goes that he was fucking living like in the twilight zone. I hadn't heard from him over the holidays. I hadn't heard from him. Yesterday morning, I go, what the fuck happened? How do you talk to somebody every other day for an hour and for 20 days? He hasn't called. And I think I called him Christmas Day to wish him a Merry Christmas. And he fucking broke down yesterday. He goes, it was, it was, it was just shocking. He goes, the, the, the drugs was one thing, but making... <laughs> <laughs> I almost crashed the car. He was serious. But the making of the meth was just too much yeah. you know that that's uh would, would that would that have uh scared you away i was talking to paul the other day and i said if if a girl came to me and said i she had herpes because we're talking about people with stds and in these in this day and age a lot of people have herpes or whatever they have i don't think i would even if a girl came up to me and we started dating she said oh i have herpes you just don't want to date i don't think i could do it i don't know not, now you're married but when you were 20 if a girl came to you and said after you've been dating, I have herpes. Would you, would you still have done it? I would have punched the shit out of him. 
Herpes. You yeah. fucking carry that shit the rest of your life. You I know. A on your lip once a fucking month. You gotta yeah. wear a fucking mask like it's Halloween and but shit. But they're saying like one in four people have it now, or even more than that. So it's it's fucking fucking no, you scary. You have no idea what's out there. Yeah. You know, for uh, let me tell you something. I've been with women that I've known were promiscuous, mm-hmm. and their fucking pussies are delicious. <laughs> Their pussies are delicious because a woman that's promiscuous likes to fuck, so that means she takes care of that fucking little dragon eater. You hope so. Do you understand me? I The dirtiest women, I've said this before, the hardest time I had with dirty women was between 90 and 93, around there, 94. I was dating a couple college girls. Filthy. Filthy, the shit I got from them. You mean just like... Dirty? Like, they weren't dirty. The pussies were good. They, okay. Their assholes smelled good. They were clean. No underarm. It was that they went to college. Like the one girl, I didn't figure out. Like she was like, I, 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 I fucked two guys, but I've sucked like 18 cocks. And I didn't. And she goes, in college, I didn't fuck. I just mashed. I still remember her saying mash. That means uh, you make out with somebody. Okay. And I gave blowjobs. And that fucked me up a little bit. Like I'm making out with Cy Beta fucking <laughs> Kappa here, you know. And uh, you ever see Clerks? I, I, not really your movie, but there's a line in. There. No, it's a great movie, Clerks. I haven't seen it in 20 fucking years. It's just. Years. It's just. I don't know whether it's like I. He, my girlfriend sucked thirty dicks in a row, and it just like he. There's a whole fight because she sucked thirty, 30 dicks. dicks. Oh no, no, and it's amazing that these girls even counted the dicks in college. Oh yeah, I lost. Count. And I dated her. Yeah. And then I dated her ex roommate, and she was really filthy. And I got something. I got a social disease, but I never went to the doctor. Like, I was so embarrassed that I got it, I never went to the doctor, and I don't know what happened to it. I like, think the Drano probably killed it. My dick stopped leaking, you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't even, uh, it was just it was just a weird time, but I, I learned a lot that college girls are dirty. I don't know fucking why. I don't know what it was that I got diseases. It's the first time you get away from your parents, I think. I never I never really went crazy in college. It just, I don't know why, but it's, uh, a lot of people do experiment a lot in college. I don't know. I experimented a lot in high school, so who needs to experiment in college if you experiment in fucking high school? You know what I'm saying? What? What? Lee, do you know what today is? What's today? It's Mercy's birthday. Oh, of course. Can you fucking believe that? No, it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy almost two years now because when, when you first told me she was pregnant, but that's... It's that little girl's fucking birthday today, and I am uh, deeply blown away. That's one part of my life that's just blown away. Like, every time, I can't grasp it. What are you guys doing? We're going to the Long Beach Aquarium. We're going to go down there and eat. I'm going to come right back. Getting her a cake and stuff? I'm going to get a Carvel cake. But uh, we have no kids. We don't know no fucking kids. So we're just going to blow out a candle and put her in bed at 6. And we're going to celebrate. i got to be on a plane at 4, you know. Yeah, I think I think uh, when no, you start no, at no. two, you can start yeah, having birthday no, parties. Right but now, I went to a one-year-old party last year, and the kid fell asleep. It's for the parents. Yeah, we stuck around and just talked to the parents. The kids fell asleep. Yeah, the kid was dressed up like a fucking uh, Toy Story. Oh, okay. And he fucking <laughs> passed out. Can you imagine that being dressed up like Toy Story and you pass out? You oh. fucking fag! Wake up, cocksucker! That was one of the things we talked about with my mom, like because we always did birthday parties at my house because I had a nice yard. And just the going going through the memory of all the birthday parties I had was uh was pretty crazy, but uh, yeah I, I don't think there's any point in doing anything before two. That's I crazy though. She's one years old. Two, maybe three, four. You know, and you get the fuck you get Pearl Jam to show up for the fifth birthday and shit. Forget about it. Like a motherfucker. Uh, it's it's been a fucking last night. I got home and I I, uh, I took a shower last night. I went to jujitsu guys and. We talked about goals yesterday. I have this notebook, and every week I have four goals: two kettlebell classes and two jujitsu's. You know, and Lee, I gotta tell you something. Every time I go to fucking jujitsu, I hug the cats. I mean, I'm dead serious. It ain't easy. For me. You're still scared? Uh no, no. I, I've been getting better and better. So I wanted to go one time this week, even if I went and did the. Even I, I thought about the YMCA last night. And I have the world available to me. I got John Salami, who's a black belt, and I have 10 Planet, Van Nuys, they have a back room. So even if there's a class going on, you go to the back room and kill yourself. It's small, you know? And I just wanted to work on my cardio, so I said, fuck it, I went down there. <coughs> it was amazing. I judged, when I first used to meet with John Salami, if I just grab his gi and we'd roll, like just not even roll, like just push and pull for a minute, I'd have to stop get up, open the door, and take my gi top off. And pee. 
<laughs> and take my dick out, open your gi, which is disgusting. Were you having a panic attack? Or? I would have panic attacks and I couldn't breathe. Last night, though, the first thing, we rolled like four minutes and I tapped. And then we looked at each other. He told me what I did wrong, what I did right. And then we did it again for like four and a half minutes. Then we just drilled for like 15 minutes. And then we rolled again for another three. By that time, I was dead. But uh, on the drive home, even if he tapped me four times, I didn't expect to do I don't give a fuck. You know, it was the little things I did. Uh, I felt so accomplished on the way home, you know, because Guy Lee, whatever your fucking name is, Guy Lee, I'll take I it. was fucking petrified the first couple times. I went, and embarrassed. You know, you're embarrassed. You're embarrassed around 20-year-olds. You're 400 fucking pounds. And you're trying, to, you look, you're trying to do hip escapes, and you look like a fucking whale. You're like a whale that beached, and now he's trying to go to Santa Barbara and buy a suit or some shit. You know what I'm saying? That's what you look like when you do a fucking hip escape. And consciously, I knew this, but I, I knew the more I went down there and did it, Lee, I fucking, and now it's like second nature. And I'm pissed because I can't go again. Some kid's supposed to train me in Buffalo. Oh, okay. So You've been it? doing it for like six months, haven't you? Close to it? Yeah, but the, the, uh, the third and fourth month, I was going once a week, and I was just taking, like, I was pushing it away. Like, I was pushing away the sparring because I was scared of the cardio. But I realized last night that getting into this kettlebell class really helped me because that scares the fuck out of me. He puts you in the back of the gym and the door is 50 feet away. So just that gives me anxiety, Lee. Just, let me tell you something, just that gives me anxiety now. That the bathroom's far away. Like I'm sweating where they're going to put me on this fucking plane. Did I tell her I wanted an aisle seat? Because lately by mistake they've been putting me in the fucking window seat. That's anxiety for me. Really? Because <clears throat> I got to bother somebody to go fucking pee. I don't like bothering nobody. Just switch with me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get up 80 times. I don't even want this on my thought. Oh, you know? you, I'd never get up. That's why I stopped with the fucking edibles. That's why I oh, gave okay. them a break the last three weeks. Because, oh, and I'll tell you what, I feel a lot better. I feel a lot clear-minded. You know, uh, and, and, you know, I love medical marijuana. I love smoking pot. But I was eating 15 fucking edibles a day. And it was becoming to be toxic. Like I was just high all the time. And I took three days off. And I'm like, whoa. This feels a lot fucking better. There's, yeah. there's been a cloud in my head for the last six well, fucking months. There's definitely a hangover. It's not as bad as, as uh, alcohol, but especially because I, I would only do it once in, in the next day. And the hunger it. is amazing. Oh, well, yeah. The, the fucking, when you eat an edible, the hunger is off the charts. Like, you can't go to bed unless you eat a fucking, and a, and a half a sandwich ain't going to cut it. You no. fucking go for everything. You're like, I'm going to fucking eat everything. Yeah. So I gave that a breather for a couple of weeks. I got some Chibo chews right there on the table, but even when I was flying, I was getting too much. I'll bring a Chibo chew just in case I get stuck in an airport because you might as well have a fucking Chibo <laughs> chew in you if you get stuck in an airport. But uh, it, it's just amazing the things I wanted to give a break to. Josh, the the, uh, the the UFC referee, before he went to prison for 18 months, he got cleaned up. And I asked him, I go, how does it feel to be off the reef? And he goes, you know what? It made a tremendous difference in my jiu-jitsu breathing. Right now, I'm okay. I still got to tap from time to time because of my breathing. But Lee, every time I go, there's a kid that every time I go, his name is Zach. Okay. He's a 23-year-old kid. Every time I go to jiu-jitsu, he goes, where's the flying Jew at? What are you going to bring? <laughs> uh, no, I have to start trying it out. I have to do something. I didn't want to do, I don't want to be the, one of the assholes who signs up for gym January 1st. Yeah, no, no, no. no. But uh, I, def I definitely have to do something. And I don't know if jiu-jitsu is it or, or what, but I, I, I'm excited about it. Well, I'll I mean, tell you why I like this jiu-jitsu, and I'm going to be honest with you, Lee. It's becoming my social life. Yeah? It's becoming my social life. You know, ever since I stopped doing drugs, I don't have a social life. A lot of people send me emails, and that's one of the biggest things. You know, what do you do now? What the fuck do you do now? You know? And, uh, I, you know, I have friends that are fucking whatever in the entertainment business, and after a while, Lee, you get sick of hanging out with them because that's all you talk about. You just want to talk to people about normal shit. Their kids, their cats, you know. And I go to this jujitsu. And at first, I was very embarrassed. But I tell you, what makes me go back more on the health issue is the issue that I just talk to normal people. Nobody laughs at me. Nobody fucking judges me. They respect you for being there. It's the weirdest fucking thing. You go to a jujitsu class. You get on that mat. Even if you do one push up, do one lap, and learn a technique. They respect you for being there. It's like, hey, man, you're one of us now. And I'm a 50-year-old man, and I, and I don't really feel self-conscious in there, and I'm overweight, and I'm out of shape, and I never wrestled. I don't feel self-conscious in there at all no more. 
I feel like I'm part of something, and I can't tell you how special that makes me feel at 50. I'm not stabbing people. I'm part of something that, in fact, they're goofy. Jiu-Jitsu guys now are not these big fucking arm guys. Yeah. It's IT guys. They're all editors. I tell you, my school's all editors. One guy does uh, the, 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 the extra, extra. He does that Oh, one. okay, yeah. Yeah, no, all these guys are editors. There's three editors over there where I work. That's crazy. No, it's uh, I kind of do miss. I was never, trust me, I never thought I'd be anywhere. I never thought I'd even play in high school. But I, I was always, my mom always had me a part of some sort of sports team. And I kind of do miss that. I was ne- like, I was always the worst on the team. It's just, when I'm with you, what do we talk about? We don't. Yeah. We talk about podcasts. Yeah. We talk about podcasts and business. And and when you talk about Diagostino, yeah, you talk about funnies, but but it's basically podcasting or, or or tomorrow's or next week's or what do we want to do for the future? It's nice to get out of there once in a while. And your yeah. girlfriend is great, but after a while, you need out of that too. Mm-hmm. There's there's three things you need, you know. So you go down there. Uh, and for me, it was like the comedy store and stuff, but that even got old because you're going someplace and you're talking to people about, hey, did you do that room yet in Mississippi? Nobody really. It takes a while to break that wall down and to really get to know people and to go out and not talk about it. It's going to come up in conversation. That's one of the hardest things about moving anywhere after college is learning how to make friends because even the, the people you're going to be friends with are people you work with, but you always, like you said, you always talk about, oh, the, the shitty boss. Or can you believe this new guy? What he did? So like, how do you? I, I don't even know. You can't really get out of friends. it. Friends, you can't get out of it. You can't you get can't, out. Of it. Yeah. You know, when I first uh, in 2007, when I quit Blow, I knew I had to fill the void. So I joined a kung fu school. Boy, was I ever embarrassed! <coughs> I walked in there at 400 fucking pounds, and I had a little bit of cardio from hitting the mitts with Justin Fortune, but no, I had nothing. And. Uh, that was the first place where it was a good school. I learned a lot, but I did not. Uh, I did not make friends. I went there. I talked to people. I giggled with people. But once I walked out the door, that's where it ended. Were you embarrassed or? No, no, no. I wasn't embarrassed at all. Because you just make you dip. make friends wherever you go. No, I made friends in the class. Okay. But when I left there, okay, that's where it ended. Nobody exchanged phone calls. Nobody really did much. I was friends with the instructor who I haven't spoken to in about six months, and I, and I had a dream about him yesterday. Uh, the black guy, I had him on Duncan's podcast, yeah. uh, Earl White, and it's weird how uh, nothing came of that. When I went to the kickboxing place, it was closer to my house, and I noticed they always had cookouts and shit like that, but they're Thai, and they have Thai food, and I fucking hate Thai food, <laughs> so I wouldn't go to the fucking cookouts because every time I go, they have like a chicken dead hanging up or some shit. Uh, or some subak do juice or whatever the fuck they drink. But there were nice kids there, and I became friends with a couple of younger girls and a couple of younger guys. And But again, I didn't do nothing socially with them. When I joined this jiu-jitsu school that weekend I did in Pasadena, mm-hmm. 60 of them yeah. fucking came out from jiu-jitsu and, and, and Eddie's school and the other school, and it's weird that we had this little uh, thing going on, you know, and uh, it just impressed me. Like all these young kids. Last week when I went, New Year's Eve, there was a class. And half the people were like, we were thinking of coming to your show. And I told them, no. <clears throat> it's too much drama for tonight. I'm at the improv in two weeks. I'm in Melrose. Yeah. I don't want you guys to be mixed up into that. It was fucking crazy up there late. Lee, me and Steve Simone went up there. We got out of the car at 8 o'clock, 10 to 8. It was packed. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Packed. Not the club. Universal City. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. And it wasn't even getting started. You could see the fucking people walking up the hill in droves, Lee. Droves. Droves. You couldn't believe how many people were going Universal. And it wasn't a bad deal. I've never seen it like that. Not in 15 years since the, uh, they had a big football game in Pasadena about 15 years ago. And I went up there in the daytime to give away free comedy tickets from the comedy store. And it was bumper to bumper. People were walking like this at that fucking mall. That's the way it was, New Year's Eve. That's crazy. And we got out of there at 20 to fucking 10.30. He had to do a spot at 11 at the comedy store. We got on that fucking 101 North. We went back to my house. I dropped him off, and I went upstairs. He gave me cookies and chicken cutlets, and I went upstairs instead of... I ate a Quaalude for New Year's Eve, one of the ones I had in the drawer by myself. Yeah. Those things are fucking duds. Oh, uh, that's too... We, uh, did, have you seen uh, The Wolf of Wall Street yet? No. How was it? Did you see it? Yeah, it's pretty... 
made me think about it because it It was good. Too long. It's too long. It's about. It's a, uh, see, I don't mind long movies. Jonah stole the movie again. I yeah, I like Leo. Leo's a great actor. The, I like the Leo. two of them steal Look it. We call him Leo. Yeah, like we know Leo, my, my buddy Leo. I like him. But I like Leo. No, I don't okay. mind long movies. I, I I get I get involved in the movie. I can see where they would have cut it. But especially the first ninety minutes is nonstop. You don't. It's not one of the long ones where you think about it being long. I I, I enjoyed it. And they're eating ass and doing quaaludes and snorkeling. They do so, like they they do so many quaaludes, and it's I, I I had to Google it. I don't I didn't really. We, you've talked about quaaludes, but I never really knew what they did. And just seeing how many they took, and and I can't imagine what that must have been like being the on Wall 80s Street. was vulgar. Yeah. That's why people were running out of that movie. The 80s was a timepiece which was fucking vulgar. And I sit back now and I think of the people that I grew up with and what I did in the 80s and what went on around me and how fast it changed. For example, when I left New York in 85, you could go into any of those clubs, the rooftop, all those fucking clubs area, and you could fucking empty a bag of dope on your fucking table. Jesus. And waitresses would walk by and nobody would say shit to you. Yeah. It was crazy. And people were, I remember being like in studio on a Thursday night with my buddy Mike Askeles and snorting coke in the woman's bathroom and seeing people sucking a cock right in the bathroom like a woman giving head in the fucking bathroom. Jeez. That's how vulgar the 80s were. Uh, well, when you see it, you're going to, if I, like, I just imagine your life going down two roads. If your life, if you had maybe been in school for like a little bit longer and ended up on Wall Street, you would have made $18 million, but you would have been dead 20 years ago. I'll explain something to you. I almost did that on Wall Street. That was the plan. You just seeing how I mean, because that was the plan. The, All my friends went, half of them went to jail. Yeah, because this is based on a book that the guy wrote, and now it's a movie. So I'm sure it's a little bit exaggerated. But if it, if it's half of what it says it was, you could have made a billion dollars on Wall Street. I was in Colorado. I was in the, it was 1987, mm-hmm. and I was 25 years old, 24 years old, right? Yeah. And I had a bunch of friends that had gone down to Florida right after high school. And they were working for some guy. The guy had yachts and houses and boats and blah, 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 blah. And they all went down there. And like six of them came back like fucking mummified. Like, yeah, it was great. We made some money. You know, they were like fucking mummified. You know, and I, I don't forget. I, I, there was two or three guys. I remember what their names were. And there was, and they were two or three years older than I was. Okay. But they were recruiting people down there. And one of the guys they recruited was a McNeil, one of the kids I grew up with. I was I grew up with his brother. They were Irish. They had nineteen fucking brothers. He was the one two years younger than me. That guy, by the time, because he just kept recruiting North Bergen kids, he was telling them go get a degree, or whatever, and he was giving them a million dollars. This is no shit. Yeah. Like three of them ended up going to jail for stock fraud. Like ten of them ended up losing their licenses and getting probation. Really? And I remember that we had a friend that had a seat. In the stock exchange or something like that, something crazy. We had like a friend and all that. I'm telling you, but they kept calling me in Colorado, going, "When are you gonna come? The guy will take you shopping right off the bat. You get suits. He gives you a car. You come down here. You work in the sun. It was a party, but they all went to jail. Trust me, it was very close. What did I? I minored in economics, economics yeah. but I majored in history. Once I couldn't become a lawyer, that was what I was trying to do. But it blew my whole cover because with a felony, you can't get a fucking stock license. Oh, okay. Because the way they made it seem is that all it is is glorified sales. And and know who steals the beginning of the movie is Matthew McConaughey. He does a fucking really great sure, job. And it, listen, being an agent, being a lawyer, all that shit is glorified sales. Mm-hmm. That's the bottom line. People have to get that out of their fucking minds that they're a, an account executive. You're a fucking salesman. And they pad themselves with that. That's why when you're, when, when you're a salesman, you're a fucking animal. You have to be a fucking animal. That's what they talked about in the movie, right? Mm-hmm. You got to be a fucking animal to be a fe- Like those people that you go work for, Lee, how you doing? You call people and you tell them good morning. No, you're not going to sell nothing. Mm-hmm. People want to be fucked up in the head a little bit. They want to be pushed. They want to be pushed in the mornings. Whenever. They want to be a little fucking boom so you could sell it. That's how you fucking activate their juices. If I call you and go, hi, Lisa, I, uh, I'm selling subscriptions to the LA Times. Are you interested? You're going to go, no. You're going to give me a minute to sell you. I'm going to go, okay, thank you. Boom. I didn't sell you. A salesman will call you and go, hey, get you involved. The involved. What are you reading now? I read Newsweek. Well, listen, for $16.95 a year, it's usually, and then they start talking money. 
When I saw when I saw sports on the phone, mm-hmm. they came from a stockbroker fucking background. Okay. So the pitch was to knock you off your chair, and then they attack, mm-hmm. and they keep attacking. And every fucking thing you say, they go back to the attack. Bam! Back to the attack. They don't know nothing. They don't know whatever you... Well, what's the mileage on the car? It's looking at 289 a month. Give me a thousand down. Well, what's the wheels per centimeter? Listen, give me a thousand down. I'll make it two fifty two a month. <coughs> and you just keep talking money until they yeah. fucking bite. That's what those guys. That's the school of those guys. To keep that energy up and to keep that manhole up, you got to pump, Jack. Yeah. So there's. If you go you see this pump. movie, you might have. You might have like one of your moments where you start thinking about like the days. You don't don't have a cheaper oh, chew. I do not have to go see that movie. I yeah. read the reactions of people. Yeah, and I spoke to people who called me back. I have a dear friend that's crazy from Brooklyn, and he called me insulted. He says it was borderline pornography. Oh yeah. He goes, they were fucking and sucking. Welcome to the eighties. <laughs> Why do you think I talk the way I do? Because I talk the way I do. No, because in the eighties, if you, in the eighties that shit that you talk to women about now wouldn't fucking work. Women wanted it more direct. Women wanted it more direct. Women didn't want to be finger fucked or let's do this. No, you got coke? Yeah. Here's the deal. We're going to go back. We're going to get a hotel at the fucking Crown Royal. And I'm going to stick fucking coke rocks up your pussy and, and suck your ass. You in? Sure. And it was amazing. It <laughs> yeah. was amazing. Girls would go back and they'd get naked before you even put a line of coke out. Within the first 20 minutes, I think he does a line of coke out of a black hooker's asshole. It's fucking. <laughs> Did you get emotional? Did I get no? No, it's fine. I I really enjoy it. I like Scorsese, so it's cool to see. But just thinking about you watching it, you I don't know if you, you might have to leave the movie theater. Like it's just I, I just imagine you in that life. No, it's it's it's. Uh, I want people to understand where society has gone. The eighties were so vulgar that politically correct started. All this politically correct shit. We call here we go. Out. Speaking of politically incorrect, what's happening, my brother? Hey, Coco, what's happening? On the line with my fucking brother from uh, 50 years ago, Ray Canella, boom, boom, in the middle. What's happening, brother? <laughs> not much, not much. Say not hello much. to Flying hey, Jew. He's I, in I, here, too. At first, I thought I was calling Pizza Hut. I was going to, like, get a box, a uh, dinner box, and, uh, you know, a few wings and... Uh, uh, stuff like that. How do you, you eat know, your How do you eat your wings, Ray Canella? How do you eat your pizza, wings? Pizza Hut number. What the hell is this? No. How do you eat your wings with blue cheese or with fucking ranch? Oh God, no, no. Actually, no. I don't do the blue cheese or the celery with my wings. If 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 the public is dying to know, uh, the answer is no. I do not do the blue cheese. I'm sorry. You fucking but I enjoy, slipping I enjoy tuck wings sucker. and 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 other various. You're meals. probably eating hummus yeah. and shit too, aren't you? <laughs> Fucking I mean, so often. You're from North Bergen. I'm mean, so supposed often. to eat hummus. I have to, I have to keep my girlish figure. You know that. I fucking hate you. Ray, how long have we been friends? Break it down. Oh, lordy, 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 lordy. 45 years? Six, 45, six, uh, 40, six, well, my God, 40 years, 45 years? Sixth grade, Mr. I mean, Levito? We, we go all the way back to North Bergen and McKinley School and... Uh, Charles Cord and hanging out in the projects, hanging out in the streets, hanging out in the woods, uh, doing all sorts of things. <laughs> hanging out in my basement. <laughs> we were in a band. What was the name of our band in the sixth grade when we had Levitos? Oh, Lord. That I don't recall. We didn't have a that fucking I don't name. Recall. We just covered Beatles, Help, and Jackson 5 songs. That's right. Well, you you were a tremendous Jackson Five fan, but then again, you know we all liked you know we we all liked a lot of different stuff. Yeah, my yeah, father yeah. was a musician. My father was a drummer, and so it wasn't unusual for me to have all different types of music in the house. But I was uh, because of my older brother, I was a little bit of a rocker. But you had you know you had the whole you know the whole Latino thing going when I would come over to your house and the. The Sailor Cruz would be on, and the Salsa would be on, and there'd be good music going on. So we had that going on all around us. So while I was a bit of a rocker and I was into the Beatles, um, you were definitely into Jackson 5. You were definitely into things with more of a beat, with more of a rhythm to it. You guys got me into, well, I'll tell you, uh, spending our summers on 38th Street Park, uh, your brother and all those older guys would open up their cars, and the two albums I 
remember, like the back of my hand, a Peter Frampton comes alive, and uh, right. Led Zeppelin, the song remains the same. And then the Who, yeah. Who Are You? I mean, the Who, Who. I remember when the Who came to town in 77, like your brother and all his friends would just play Who Are You, that whole album. And uh, we were exposed yeah. to great music and we were raised when it was, you know, Lee and I were speaking about this the other day. We were raised when it was $10 to go see Yes on a Tuesday That's night. Right. Oh, yeah. And we I would mean, all go the over day, there and uh, shit. I used to go. I used to go to the Dr. Pepper shows down on the pier in Manhattan, uh, Pier Forty Eight for seven dollars, and go see Carlos Santana and Jefferson Starship and uh, David Gilmore and oh my goodness me, all the all the all the great shows. But the other thing that I remember about you and I, when it came to records, was that we also had comedy albums. You would bring over the Richard Pryor. And I had the best of Bill Cosby, you know, Russell, my brother, and, and Noah and the Noah and the Ark, you know, all those great comedy routines from the Bill Cosby albums. You brought over to Richard Pryor, and my mother caught you and I listening to Richard Pryor at a point where <laughs> he was talking about, I think, oh, God, I'm trying to remember. He was either saying if you wanted to learn how to lick pussy, you had to lick stamps. Or it was something like that. It was like licking stamps was like licking pussy. And <laughs> and my mother walks in the door while you and I are listening to this. <laughs> and she's like, turn that off. What are you listening to? I think she I wasn't allowed in your off. house for a while either. <laughs> I don't think I was. <laughs> I don't know. I think the record wasn't allowed in my house for a while. Mom, my mom was pretty cool. Mom, mom let all the kids in the house. You know, what my, I remember from we your all house. hung out at my place. What I remember specifically uh, 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 from your mom house. Was very cool. Mom was very cool like that, but we were young. So we were to listening young. to a record like that um, took my mom by surprise a little bit, I think. I remember <laughs> being at your house, and I couldn't wait to go because you would always <laughs> offer me grape Kool-Aid with seltzer water in it. And it was the greatest yeah. thing in the fucking world, to use club soda instead of water and grape Kool-Aid. You know those these water drinks they're inventing now with the flavored water? Yes. Ray Canella invented that shit yeah. 45 fucking <laughs> years ago. Ray, Ray, remember we were part of the ecology club and shit. You know, I try to explain my grammar school, our grammar school, because it was a different time. Yeah. Cuban hit kids had come, and they didn't know English, so McKinley School, the whole North Bergen system, would hold them back till they'd be 16. And then they put them in the pilot program, yeah. <laughs> and, and they'd become a oh, sophomore yeah. in high school. Do you remember, like, we had so yeah. many, like, I remember this is Louis Zaldivar smacking Leo Gattoni one time. Oh, I remember that. Do you remember yeah. when, when Mr. Yeah. Totora hit me and Anthony oh. Balzano and Carmine oh. came and beat up Mr. Totora? You were in school with us, and they used to call me Coco Cademoco with yeah. Martin Perez. Yeah. Do you remember that shit? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah, hell yeah. I remember, well, Norfolk in high school was crazy. I mean, we'd... we'd <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go into the bathroom and everybody's everybody's smoking in the bathroom. Remember Mr. Lee? Remember the gym teacher, Mr. Lee? Yes, I remember Mr. Lee. And you'd Lee. go he'd come into the bathroom and everybody would be smoking either cigarettes or weed or whatever. And the moment Mr. Lee walked into the bathroom, you hear all the cigarettes going out in the toilets. And he and he would yell, If you ain't shitting a piss and get out and we would <laughs> It all file out of the bathroom, you know, billows of smoke coming out of the boys' room. You know, today, Jesus Christ, we'd, we, if that happened today, we all would have been arrested, thrown into rehab, pictures on the front page in the newspaper, you know, the whole thing. But uh, it, it, it was a different time, wasn't it? You know, it's crazy. I always go home and I always drive by the neighborhood. And uh, I know that for me us, too. that neighborhood is a, a blessing. And at the same time, it brings me a lot of pain, that neighborhood. Every time I go through, I think of the friends we lost. And uh, I think of how many times, you know, that. remember that phone, the police phone at the bottom of your hill in the box? How many times we ripped that out and ran? Like by, Le oh, by yeah. Leonetti Fuel right there. And, uh, you know, I still talk yeah. to Vita Special. Yeah. And I still, I know Michael's online. He won't talk to me, Michael Special. Online because uh, no, no, he won't talk to me. He even told Vita he didn't fucking remember me, but he told Vita like a smoke screen. <clears throat> and I still remember uh, him walking up the corner and me going, uh, Mike, what's up? And him going, fuck you guys, my brother died. And uh, 
it was all your fucking faults and shit, and me trying to hug him, and he wouldn't talk to me. And that's the last time I basically saw Mike, you know. And uh, Oh, I, my. How I, long ago was that? That was the day Dominic died, that fucking morning, when uh, it was oh a Monday, God. you know. Uh, and, yeah. and these yeah. are times that's that... That's a terrible day. You, you know I was there. No, so, we um, were all there. I mean, I wasn't there. But uh, I think about Anthony now. There. I think I, about I, the. I think about the pain. Unfortunately, and I was, and uh, it it haunts me to this day. You know, what happened that day? Um, I'll never forget it. You know, it 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 it, it, it um, that incident had a profound effect on me. Oh, a profound effect um, on the neighborhood. As, as, as did on the neighborhood. Anthony uh, Balzano yeah. had a profound effect on me, and um, that's one of the difficult things about. Um, looking back at the old days is because unfortunately there was a lot of tragedy. Uh, uh, you know, 15 year olds aren't supposed to die. You know, at 15, you feel invincible and to lose, uh, 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 Anthony, uh, at that age was just, I, 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 my entire world was pulled out from All of me us. because All I of saw us. him one minute, you know, he was at my house. I'll never forget. He was at my house. I had just bought, uh, Pink Floyd's Animals had come out, and uh, it was the newest Pink Floyd album. I had just bought it, and I went, uh, you know, Anthony and I are listening to the album in my basement, and his brother came by to pick him up, to drive him home, and that was the last I saw of him. And um, that sort of thing to a 15-year-old who has never really been faced with death before, uh, uh, it, 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 it just, you know, it, it was devastating. And then only a few short years later, uh, when Dominic passed, well, I blamed myself, uh, for the longest time. I blamed myself. And you I, remember I in thought, between uh, Anthony uh, and Dominic, my mother died. So for yeah, me, that's right. that's it right. adds, right. I still remember my mother dying. Oh yeah. My mother died 79. Anthony died in 80. And I don't know what I was doing yeah. on that fucking block. And I remember seeing Michael Dominic Wolf. died in eighty. In Dominic 80. Special died in nineteen eighty, um, and that was a terrible, 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 terrible tragedy. Um, and uh, the, the 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 truth of the matter was that um, we had just arrived at the lake where we were going to go swim. It was an excessive, excessively hot day. It was uh, well into the nineties that day. We had literally just arrived, and everybody jumped in the lake to cool off, and that's when the incident occurred. There was not enough. We certainly weren't there long enough to uh, consume any sort of heavy amounts of alcohol or weed or anything like that. We had literally just arrived, and it was so hot out that we wanted to cool off first before doing anything else. So um, I never really stuck around well, not so much I didn't stick around, but I never really got to hear if um, if drugs played a part in it or alcohol played a part in it. If it did, I certainly didn't see any of that happening. Uh, uh, again, we were simply we literally just arrived and um, decided to jump in the water. And I was in the water with him, and I turned my back on him for a minute uh, to swim to the shore of the lake, and he was gone, you know? So I blamed myself for a very long time because I figured, you know, if anybody was going to save this guy, it was going to be me. But over the years, um, as you get older and you have more life experiences, uh, you tend to discover that the, the reason these things happen is because they happen and that there's really not much that one can do about it. You know, why do things happen? Because they happen, you know, and it's that simple. Uh, I think sometimes people like to search for greater explanations for things, but unfortunately, sometimes an accident is simply that, an accident. Uh, and it was a very unfortunate, I mean, it was just, boy, that, that sent me into a really bad spot oh for my God. a long time. Oh my God. I, I, Ray, you know, I, I don't think I saw you after that for a while. You were very depressed. You know, that yeah. was the nail on the cherry for me. You know, Anthony was yeah. one thing. My mother was another. Yeah. Now three people in three years that are fucking family with yeah. you. And uh, it, it, it yes. f fucked me up for 15 years. And let's talk about the other side of the coin. You know, my mother used to come home from the bar 
in Union City every night about 3.30, and she'd wake me up, Raymond, and she'd bring me mm-hmm. a, a, a BLT from the Four Star Diner or a Cuban sandwich nice. from Hernandez or something like that, and I'd wake up. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And one night when I was a sophomore in high school, I went out and I did a hit of acid, and I came home and I went to bed, and I... Uh, <laughs> fell asleep and you know one of those acid trips that you, you you fall asleep and i heard her come home and at one point i heard a yell for me and, and i said you know what i don't want to go downstairs and uh an hour later i got up to figure out why she wasn't in bed and she was on the kitchen floor dead and for years i had to beat myself about whether or not i should have came down mm-hmm. when she called but mm-hmm. i'm in the same boat as you when god comes knocking even if i would have gone down there what would have, what, she was having a heart attack or whatever i didn't know this but for years, yeah. not really years, I, I, I got to be honest with you, it took me about a year to figure out that uh, when the man comes knocking, the man comes knocking. There's nothing I could have done. But I lived with that for, for a while. You know, I lived with the yeah. fact that I if I would have came down, because I would have saved her life. So I'm telling you, mm-hmm. uh, looking back at that neighborhood, I love it with all my heart because I got to tell you, it's who the fuck I am today. It's, oh, my God. Yeah. You know, that basketball court mm-hmm. was where mm-hmm. I learned hard work. That 38th Street basketball court was where I learned how to fucking work in the sun, running up and down that fucking hill. How high was that hill behind right. Black Marlowe's house? With the, <laughs> remember Black Marlowe? She's like the younger bunga woman. That's some <laughs> steep shit. Well, we have some steep hills in North Bergen, but you know, your mom, your mom was a hell of a cook. Oh, please. Your the real Cuban shit, cook, Lee. Cook, Lee, we would have opened 800 my pounds. my taste for, for Cuban food. You know, through through hanging out with you, hanging out with your mom, going up on Burger Lane Avenue. But do you remember? Okay, now I'm going to answer. Here, here's one. I don't know if you're going to remember this. Do you remember? You and I were little, little, little. We were playing baseball in your yard. And I was pitching and you were batting. <laughs> and I pitched you the ball. And you hit the ball and you drilled me right in the goddamn head with the ball. <laughs> do you remember? No, no. You beamed me in the head with the ball. And my glasses kind of cut my cheek a little bit. You beat me in the face. It was an accident. You beat me in the face with the ball. <coughs> and uh, it was a good hit. And, uh, <laughs> and your mom came out, and she grabbed me, and she brought me inside, and she wiped my face, and she cleaned my cut, and she gave me a kiss on the head. And uh, it was, she was just, do you want, and, and, you know, so you're translating the whole time. And, uh... <laughs> And I had, she gave me soup and made me feel better. And so your mom was so sweet. <laughs> yeah, that was a long fucking time. Do you time. remember? Do you yeah. remember being in me with nah, your Boy, we had a lot of accidents in that yard. We had a lot. I took Lee. <laughs> I took Lee and showed him that yard. I took you purposely. That yard, we turned that into a little league field. That was a swimming pool. That was a basketball court at one time. Uh, right. You know, how many right. times did we go in that attic and listen to Led Zeppelin and smoke pot? You know, that's, yeah. that's what we learned. Oh, yeah. I know. Well, that wrecked it out so much you can hear the other side. Oh, my God. <laughs> How, do you, were you with me tonight? I tried to fuck uh, Faye Cardinelli's mother. Yeah, that was her name, Faye Cardinelli. <laughs> we were at the park. We, I was like 14. <laughs> I was all fucked up on fucking reefer and pill. No, we were doing THC crystal. Right? That was our THC. You know, I still talk to Carlos Perez. I still see Carlos. Uh-huh. I oh, still do see, you? Yeah, when I go to Miami, I see Carlos and... I got to tell you something, Ray. I don't see Sabatino. He stayed in Florida, huh? Yeah, Carlos stayed family. in Florida. But I got to tell you something about me and Carlos. When we look at each other, I'm happy you called today, Ray, because uh, nobody ever from down there called. And I think it's because a little bit of the pain. We all live with a little bit of that pain uh, of what happened when we were kids on it because we were very close. Raymond, we were fucking it's, close it, as it, kids. It's hard. It's hard to look back sometimes on that time because there was it. Was, it was a little. It was a little tough. It was tough for young people to be faced with death like that, you know. And 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 for young people to die. Young people aren't supposed to die. And I think that that's the thing that that you know knocked us all for a loop. Is that you know it's unnatural for a parent to bury their child. That is not the way things go. Uh, the natural progression of things is that we eventually care for our parents and and we see them through to the end you know they've taken care of us and now we see them through to the end and so losing anthony and losing dominic you know just flies in the face of that 
um, that's not supposed to happen. And then you losing your mom on top of it, that's, um, that's an awful lot for 15-year-olds to take. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, man. in a short period of time. Let me explain something I to thought you. it was anyway. It, I, 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 I was very, very messed up after Dominic's death. You uh, said something. Very me, messed you up. Ever, you, ever, you ever bump into a friend now or, and they introduce you to your, their kid? And their kid's 14, 15. And <clears throat> in the conversation, you say, how old is your son? He goes, I'm 14 and a half. And you look at this 14 and a half kid and you figure to yourself, does this kid know what I was going through at 14 and a half? Could he handle it today? That's why, that's when I learned about myself. When I saw people's kids, when I saw a 14 or 15 year old kid, and I look at him and go, could he handle what happened to us at 15 emotionally today? He would crumble. Yeah. Like it made yeah. me become a man. Like yeah. I became a man overnight. Like there was no, Michael Jackson always mm. said, I was never a child. Well, mm. bitch, let me tell you something. When my mother died, I went from being a fucking kid, a kid that played ba baseball and a kid that had a mini bike and a kid that had mm -hmm. that, that fucking, you know, just played two hand touch to just getting thrown into the sea of, it was a complete different ocean. And after facing, uh, mm -hmm. The two deaths, the, the, the death my mom was one thing. Once Dominic fucking that happened to him, I lost faith. It broke me as a human being. And you're supposed to be broken at one point, but not that's, at fucking you know, 15 that's an or interesting 16. Point. I was it's interesting broken, interesting you say that, that it broke your faith, because I, I would agree. Um, I, I, I would agree. I think the exact same thing definitely, definitely happened to me. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I totally agree. It destroyed me. It destroyed me. For, uh, I say, 15 fucking It wasn't minutes. fair. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. But you know what? No. Life isn't fair, and you get up, and you fucking take your cock out, and you salute the flag, and you, uh, I think that the other half of it, now here's where the other, here's where it gets interesting. The other half of it is where we grew. I mean, I still remember Robin fucking, I still remember walking back from the Meadowlands after we went to see Ted Nugent, Mahogany Rush, Poco, and Aerosmith. Do you uh -huh. remember that? Do you, remember, <laughs> do you remember being able to hear Ted Nugent from the basketball court when you were a kid from the Meadowlands? Do you fucking remember that, brother? Do you remember that, you know, Raymond? Um, well, you know, the stadium wasn't very far away. The stadium wasn't very far away. There was less construction uh, uh, around at the time, and I, th I think, I think uh, uh, when it, when a big band was playing in the stadium, you you could you could probably hear you something. Could hear depend, it. You could hear depending it, depending on on the night. But uh, uh, my mother used to have a heart attack. I used to walk used to walk out to Route Three. Used to ride our bikes out to the stadium to go see the Giant games. And my and I, you know, I'd come home on a Sunday afternoon. You know, Sunday night I'd come home. My mother said, "Where were you?" I was out at Giant Stadium. I saw the game. She says, how'd you get there? I rode my bike. You rode your bike on Route 3. What the hell's wrong with you? Fuck. And we used <laughs> Start to, screaming at me. I remember being on a motorcycle with Frankie Balzan. Are you ready for this one? I remember telling Frank, you had to go to the track one night. He goes, come on, I'll give you a ride. In the dark, with a headlight, <laughs> he put Alona Mertens on the handlebars. <clears throat> how about that name from a blast from the past? Alona Mertens, the blonde that lived on Charles wow. Court. The German girl that was fucking banging. She let me make out with her, like, in the yep. ninth grade, I made out with her in the fucking apartment. I dry humped to the debt. She wouldn't show me her pussy. I still look for her on Facebook. That little German chick was banging. Remember, she had a little sister that was hot, and she had a mother that was fucking hot. But uh, she used to date a, a kid named Eddie Lomenka. Do you remember Eddie Lomenka? Oh, yes, yes, He's yes. in Miami, too. I, I remember the names very well. Yeah. I remember the names And very I still well. talk to Mario Arias. I still talk to him ah. pretty much when I go to Vegas. I see Mario. We talk on the phone from time to time. I spoke to Levito about a year ago. And you oh, ready for this one, Raymond? Now, how old is Levito? Levito's like 60-something. He was the last one to retire. And you ready for this one, Raymond? I right. took I took Mr. Barone to the premiere of Grudge Match. Oh, did you really? Yes, I did. Yes, How's I did. he doing? He's, uh, you know, he's 60. He's still a Boston Red Sox fan. He's still wackadoo. But, uh, you know, <laughs> when I got left back over New York or Reese's Pussy in the seventh grade, and uh, he took care of me, man, and we became friends, and he taught me how to play basketball. 
And from time to time, I spoke to him, and I'm friends with his wife, and I just wanted to show him my appreciation. So I took him to the fucking premiere, and uh, we laughed, and we giggled, and we had a great time. So, You know, he was one of the few teachers that took an interest in us outside of school. He took me, he took me to a Yankee game. I went to a Yankee game with Mr. Barone, you know? Uh, uh, he was, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, and perhaps you recall better than I, but I think that he was really probably the only, the, the only teacher in that school that really seemed to genuinely be interested in the kids outside of academics or coaching, you know? And I got to tell you something. He was, he's part of the, he's, good he's, guy. he's part of the reason I became a comedian because he's funny as fuck. That dude was oh, yeah, funny that, as oh, yeah. fuck. And, you know, I always think of those kids, Charlie Gizzy and Richie Colombo and David <laughs> Bishop and shit. There's not a day that goes by. What about Dean? What about Dean LaPree? I, listen. Dean tortured Barone. I, uh, Barone, couldn't make, Barone couldn't figure Dean out for nothing. <laughs> about Christmas Eve, I get very down every Christmas Eve for about an hour. I don't know what it is, Lee. What? I miss my mother, you know, I miss my friends, I want to be in Jersey for about an hour every Christmas Eve. And this Christmas Eve, I said, you know what, honey, I got to go for a ride. I was feeling shitty. I went in the car, I put on Ozzy's Boneyard, and I was looking for a weed store, because all the weed stores were closed. <laughs> and there was a weed store that was open on Burbank. So when I went over there, guess who called me? Dean LaPree. <laughs> and we talked for 45 minutes, and that's when I realized, Raymond, that it was me, you, and Dean, and John Bender. We were the originals. We were really the originals down there. Yeah, happy John that, Bender. Uh, what a nice family, the Bender family. Hey, they also fuck, the Balzano family. They took nice me in. Family, the both huh? two families that took me oh, in. Well, and then years later, your brother uh, became your the, brother the became a cop. Era. How many fucking times did your brother get me out of fucking beefs growing up? How many fucking times? Yeah. If it wasn't for guys like your brother but and those he, guys, I would have been fucking dead right now, Raymond. I came from that neighborhood. Yeah, that I neighborhood am. fucking raised me. You don't understand. That neighborhood mm -hmm. raised me. Uh, and oh yes! Oh no, 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 no! They it, reached. Uh, let me tell you something. What, 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 what? The Balzanos and the Benders and I have such just nothing but fond memories. Uh, what, what nice family people? People who were. I mean, I mean, everybody. Yes, a lot of kids hung out at my place. You know, we we hung out at my house. We played music and we did stupid shit. But everyone hung out with the Balzanos. Everybody hung out with the benders. Um, I, I just, just nice, nice, family-oriented, generous folks. I know, for, I, I, and I'm sure you, you know that you, of all people, know that firsthand. I, uh, that's where I learned uh, the gift of friendship. I learned a lot of things from those fucking people, man. Uh, Ray, what did you end up going yeah. to do? What I see Bender on, on Facebook on every Facebook, so often. I see, I see he has a family and, some, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and all of that. And it doesn't surprise me. Very family-oriented folks. I still have to figure out an uh, apology very... for John Bender. I really do. I owe him a huge apology. But I, I'm still tight with Bobby Bender. When I go back, I get breakfast with Bobby and we talk. and We talk about the father. Oh, and nice. how, uh, <laughs> how, uh, Ray, what did you I end up doing? I haven't seen him in ages. I saw John at the last reunion. high school reunion. Yeah, that's what he was saying. They all saw you at the reunion. I saw John. Lisa Messina. I saw, I saw John at the last high school reunion, and and uh, and he looked great. And um, and yeah, I have I, I, nothing but just wonderful, wonderful, men, but but of their parents as well. You know what I mean? That that's how close. And how open they were, because I remember their folks too, you know, being nice to us kids. I remember Mr. So, Bender uh, yeah, and me. That, 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 that was the more positive <laughs> part of growing up in that neighborhood, was having people who, um, who were good family folks. Mr. Bender and I dragged one of, De Lorenzo's, one of Dennis DiLorenzo's friends who was overdosing on heroin from his basement one night. Oh, Lord. <clears throat> Mr. Bender looked at the guy and he goes, Listen, your friend's on heroin, he ain't going to die here. Coco grabbing on, we're throwing this cocksucker in the street. And to this day, I still, <laughs> I still remember looking at Mr. Bender going, I ain't touching this fuck. And him going, grab some fucking balls, grab that fucking kid, put the sandwich down. And he dragged the guy out, and he went right back and got a sandwich and ate it like it was the fuck that cocksucker. Ray, you ended up working yeah. at the Sci Fi Network for a long time, did you not? After that, for how long? Yeah. So it's really weird that we both came from a fucked up neighborhood and we ended up in entertainment. 
Yeah, it's very, very, very interesting to me that, well, f you know, it's funny because I think looking back, if you, if you grabbed uh, Dean or John Bender or Lisa Messina, Tanya, if you grabbed any of those people today and told them Coco grew up to be a stand-up comic and Ray Canella grew up to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, making science fiction and horror movies, no one would be surprised. <laughs> Absolutely nobody. <laughs> I don't think anyone would be surprised that that's where you and I ended up. Uh, uh, because it was all there in the very beginning. You know, it, 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 was, it was without question there in the very beginning. I wasn't terribly, I wasn't athletic as you guys were. I didn't play basketball. I didn't play too much baseball. I didn't play any football. I sat in a movie theater and watched monster movies. I had my mother make me go to the, go to the uh, my mother used to take me to the movies when I was a little kid constantly so I wasn't terribly athletic but um, the trajectory that you and I took um, I don't really find that all that surprising really <laughs> I do I do I really do I can't believe that we uh, you know Raymond I can't believe that at 50 we're on the fucking phone right now with each other so in this life I, what are you doing well, you now what, Raymond you, you, but you should feel a sense of validation now shouldn't you I mean I feel a sense of validation I mean when you were a very young kid you were hysterical you were an entertainer at a very young age you know so I'm I, I, I'm, 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 I'm a little surprised to hear that you're surprised because I think that I think that being an entertainer is in your DNA not everybody can do this uh, life is, you know, uh, uh, comedy is hard. Life is easy, kind of thing. So, um, I think uh, I think you landed exactly where you were supposed to be. <laughs> I think it's a sense of validation, like I said, because I turned my hobby into a career. So I do feel a sense of, you know, uh, 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 a sense of validation in that what I pursued, I was able to make a career out of. Lee, you got any questions for Raymond? Well, uh, hey, Ray, uh, Joey's told me a bunch about you for a few weeks, and uh, I, I worked in TV for not as long and no, not on the executive side, but I find it interesting because I've been telling people for a while that, that eventually there's going to be a change with TV, and I think it's pretty great that, you, that you've gone to YouTube now, and I, <clears throat> it's probably, you're probably making less than half of what you were making, but in five years you're going to have... I, I like. What do you think is going to happen in five years when you're going to have, you're going to be making ten times that, and everyone who stayed at the TV networks are going to be flipping burgers and and like, where do you think that's <laughs> Look going? Look at and shit. Like, but it, it, it's going. Fuck Lee, I love it. It's going. It's going that it's going way. There, yeah. Like you can't, you can't. It's just even with the comedy specials, I don't. I don't know where how the advertising works with what you're doing, but for. The money they're paying you and the restrictions they put on you, it's just not worth it anymore, especially when so many people aren't watching regular TV on their TV. So just like, what went That's into... very... You know what? You're really on target. No, he's on target. You're really, he's, really on ever target. Ever since that you're, Revo you're, box you're, you're, came you're out, Roku. It. the Roku shit came out, now, and I've been watching, you know, I see my wife entertained <laughs> on Netflix, and I see her watching Hulu Plus, and I see her going back to Hulu Plus, yeah. and get me another code, and how much she enjoys it. I'm seeing this, that this is, and then you watch TV, you pay, I don't know how much money you pay for premium fucking cable, and you, how many nights do you sit there? You're either watching an old movie you saw 82 fucking times, yeah. or a sporting event, and you're going, why am I paying? So, so... What, right. ha what what went into that thought process for you? Because I just went through the same thing. I left the TV, and I'm trying to do this full time. And there's there's people who think I'm crazy, and my parents my parents every day ask me to go get another job because they're worried about the college loans. But <laughs> what what like what? Explain what how like how you're doing it because a lot of people are asking me like how do you go follow your dreams? And it must have been even more. I can't imagine. How like how much thought you had to put into it at your age when I'm sure you have a family and and a lot more bills than I have. Mm -hmm. Well, it takes you know. First of all, it's a that's a great question because it was I would say my last three years, three or four years with Sci-Fi Channel, I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable because I have two teenage daughters, and I was watching just three years ago. 
three, maybe four years ago, I was watching my teenage daughters obliterate the way you and I use television. Mm -hmm. Completely, completely obliterated. They have broken all of the standardized rules, all of the standardized theories of what we thought the passive act of watching television was. These kids have obliterated it. They have started new trends such as binge viewing. Oh, yeah. You've heard of binge viewing, I right? Did, I did it last also, week. Also, yeah. the best TV the, show the I've seen in the last... The is also what I like to call screen agnostic. They do not care what device they watch their content on. Nope. They are not tied to the television the way that Coco and I were as kids. They can easily watch content on a tablet. They can easily watch content on their phone. And they're also enjoying user-generated content. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a major studio release to get a lot of attention. Now, my kid, my, my oldest, spends hours in front of the computer with her friends watching people punch each other in the balls. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what does that tell you? <laughs> You know, uh, it, it, it tells you that human nature is always going to lead the way. So while I was at Sci-Fi Channel those last three years, here I am, the only, you know, 48-year-old with a gaming system, with an Xbox. I'm trying to explain to the other guys, you've got to get online, you gotta get the, you got to get the Xbox, you got to jump in. This is a set-top box. This is a game changer. It's changing everything. And, you know, they kind of looked at me like, uh, you know, make another dopey monster movie. So, <laughs> which was what I was doing over at Sci-Fi. I was, I was having too much fun making stupid monster movies. But over the, like I said, over the course of the last three years, uh, there was an enormous, enormous shift going on. And this just isn't my observation. Uh, let's ask the people over at Borders Books, how's it going? Borders Books is out of business. Yep. The post office is suffering. The, the post office is nearly out of business. They're almost back to horses. Think that that's, and I think that that's a prime example of the digital disruption that's going on. Well, you know, uh, it, the, it is, the best TV show I've seen in, in uh, probably 10 years, have you seen House of Cards on Netflix? It's on hey, Showtime. I've, I've started on, watching it. Yeah, it used yeah. to be on Showtime. Well, there might, there might have been a well, miniseries, but it's, it's Kevin Spacey, and it knocks everything out of the water, and... He's. I was yeah, watching it with my parents. Original. I was watching it with my mom, and she said, "Why is Kevin Spacey executive producer?" I said, "Because he probably made no money with it on Netflix, but he he has some, so much more creative control. It got nominated for Emmys, and the, like, and and, right. and I don't want people to think it's just because they're sponsors. But we 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 work we worked with Hulu Plus for a few months, and they have a bunch of mm -hmm. original programming, <clears throat> and it's on par or better than anything on TV right now." And it's where things are going, because like you said, I've, it was a joke for me, because I had a, a TV in my living room, but I'd be on my bed with my laptop watching YouTube videos. It's just, right. it, it's where it's going. And have you seen the new Xbox? The Xbox One, where you plug it in, and it can be your DVR, but you have Skype, yeah, wait, baby. You have Skype <laughs> coming in, you can, you can record mm -hmm. you playing video games. There's, there's no more, like... And I like the show, Big Bang Theory. Like that show makes millions of dollars, and twenty million people watch it a week. But once that's mm -hmm. gone, once these, once this round of sitcoms are gone, I don't like. I think there's maybe five years left. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll I'll I'll, I'll tell you this much, and this is simply my opinion <laughs> and my and my perspective on on the landscape of television. Um, right now, the cablers, the cablers, and the broadcasters are throwing a lot of money at the problem. The problem being that their audience is shrinking. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the audience isn't shrinking because of lousy content. I think television right now happens to be quite excellent. I think that there's a lot of superb television on right now. Uh, 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 very high quality stuff because the cablers and the broadcasters are throwing so much money at the problem. However, at this stage of the game, the genie's out of the bottle. Their business can only shrink at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the next generation growing up cannot afford cable television. They don't want cable television. 
No. They want their entertainment the way that they've been brought up. They want their entertainment a la carte. Yeah, and I, I think there and are. So when I got out of when I got out of cable, when I left Sci Fi Channel, um, I was determined to be in the digital ecosystem, and that's what Coco and I were talking about yesterday prior to this phone call. If you're not on the internet, if you're in the entertainment business, and you're and you don't have a, a very strong presence on the internet, the ship is sailing away. Oh yeah, you're missing the boat. And I think there is. And, there, there definitely is a lot of and, good TV and I, and right I think now. That the cablers and the broadcasters live in this bubble because I go and I talk to people from. You know, I still talk to a few people at Sci Fi Channel, and people say to me things like, Oh, I'm just holding on until I can retire. You know, we know the ratings are shrinking, we know the advertiser dollars are, are leaving. I'm just holding on until I can retire. And I say, Fuck that. I don't want to hold on till I retire. I want to be relevant for the next 20 years. Yeah. And this is how Screenbox uh, uh, began. Uh, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be contacted by the founders of Screenbox when they found out that I left sci-fi. They were looking for a programmer. And uh, you know, I, I, I said, yes, of course. I mean, to have a second opportunity to work in a genre that uh, means so much to me science fiction and horror it's i'm a fan you know i mean yes i could get paid i get paid to do this stuff but i'm i'm i'm, I'm still that six seven year old kid in the theater watching monster movies i, I haven't changed that much oh no and that's <laughs> you know some people some people want to fly to the moon some people want to cure cancer i wanted to make zombie movies now you could say that maybe i didn't aim terribly high <laughs> But I'm doing it. <laughs> no, and and that's when you can tell when it's good. And you said something interesting. You said there are, there is a lot of good TV out there, and I think that's because yeah, you have to have it. No, have to right now. There, there is good TV, but the the problem is there's so much garbage. There's a TV show I saw a clip of where it was karaoke, but the woman in the middle in the middle of singing had to stick her hand in and touch snakes. There's so much garbage right now that when you turn on the TV, when you turn on the TV, it's hard to, it's hard to see it through the shit. So the good thing about Screenbox is, if like let's say I like horror, my girlfriend loves horror, so I'll show her Screenbox and she'll go and she won't see a bunch of shitty horror movies or TV shows. She'll be she'll see your whole lineup and if it's all good, she'll keep coming back. So well, the, also the other choice, the other thing about Screenbox is that it's your choice. Yeah. At your leisure, where wherever you can get a signal. If your phone gets YouTube, you can get my channel. If your tablet gets YouTube, you can get my channel. You know, one of the things that I learned at my years at Sci-Fi, because Sci-Fi Channel and these big, 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 all of these big cable networks spend millions of dollars on research. Research and focus groups. And it's wise of them to do so, and it's, and it's part of the process. And what we discovered through these focus groups and through the research is that the average household only watches between 9 and 14 channels. Yeah. Now, you know, for you guys on the phone and for everybody else listening, you know, take a piece of paper, write down on that piece of paper the television shows you watch and the networks they're on, and you're going to discover that you only watch between nine and 14 channels. If that. The rest of it, you are not paying for, you're not watching it, you're paying for it, but you're not watching it. So cable, you know, to, 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 to spend 200 bucks a month, 300 bucks a month if you have multiple sets and you have HBO, Showtime, you got bit of bit, bit of boop, you're not watching the majority of it. Now, when you go food shopping, and you spend 200 bucks on groceries, do you let three-fourths of it sit on the table to rot? Yeah, exactly. No. But that's what you're doing with cable. So the next generation gets that. The next generation sees that. You know, I was on the radio with a couple of guys just the other day, and they were complaining that Netflix went up to eight bucks a month. You know, so the yeah. next generation is, is, is not only obliterating the business model, but the pricing, the market, the, 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 what the market, the market can only charge, you know, they can only charge what the market will bear. Mm -hmm. And the next generation is giving them the finger. 
and saying no. <laughs> and you know what's crazy? I'm not going to pay this. You know what's crazy about that? I don't know anybody. Like, everyone, almost everyone has Netflix, but I don't even know anyone anymore who still has the DVDs delivered. It's all streaming. Like even having the well, DVD, yeah. even having the DVDs delivered yeah. now, no one does because yeah. because they raise the yeah, prices. Well, tangible and, and, media is t- tangible media is done. You know, it's all files now. And yep. again, this is the way that the next generation is being brought up. This is what they're being acclimated to. Yep. And so it was funny because I got put in a position, you know, I was part of the team that launched Sci-Fi Channel 20 years ago. I was, I was hired before <coughs> Sci-Fi was on the air. So I was one of the original programmers. And launching that channel and then being a part of Screenbox and launching that channel, the the theories of the, th- the theories and the thought processes of launching a channel remain the same. Mm-hmm. It's the infrastructure that's completely different now. So can you explain to people what a programmer is for people who aren't in TV? Well, you know, I mean, basically uh, what I do is um, I try to, as a programmer, you try to give the channel its voice. You try to give the channel its attitude. You try to give the channel its personality. And you do that through the programming, through the shows that you select that you want to present on your channel and at what times you want to present them. And the nice thing about the digital ecosystem is that I'm, I'm free. I am free of the shackles of broadcasting cable in that my material is unedited, uncut, no interruptions, no commercials, no pop ups, nothing. You're paying a fee and you're watching a movie. There's no promos in between. You can stop the movie when you want. You could start the movie again. Uh, it's completely liberating as opposed to cable. Now, I work in horror and science fiction, okay? So, as a storyteller, because I was also a producer of movies at sci fi, as a storyteller, all right, you're trying to tell a horror story. Horror relies on moments of tension, moments of dread, moments of suspense. Okay, so you're building up these moments in the viewer, and then the screen goes blank and it's a goddamn Burger King commercial. <laughs> yeah. And everyone has their hamburgers and they're dancing around and they're happy, and it bounces you out of the movie, it bounces you out of the horror. And as a programmer, the sci-fi channel and as a fan of these movies it break my heart yeah you know because but because the movie goes to commercial at a critical point and it destroys the narrative and thankfully i'm free of that now raymond do you uh, remember these taking movies a... can go up and and people can enjoy them the way that they're intended to be enjoyed horror cannot be interrupted i can't watch american horror story with the friggin commercials I struggle with Walking Dead, even on the DVR. If I got to pick up the remote and fast forward through the commercials, it's disruptive to me. Yeah, no, exactly. Raymond, do you remember taking the bus to Jersey City, getting high and going to see, like, Dawn of the Dead and all that shit? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Shit, yeah. I mean... (laughs) uh, Richard Pryor live on the Sunset Strip. Dude, we used to go to the State Theater down in Jersey City, down in Journal Square, yeah. and go see Song Remains the Same, yeah. and then stop at White Castles later on for, for the munchies. You know, I drove with Bobby Bender down Bergenline Avenue one night, and we pulled up in front of the Union, <laughs> the Union City Cinema, and I thought of all the fucking films I watched oh there, God. from The Longest Yard oh to Tommy. God, the one on Bergenline, Yeah, right? I think you and I went to Tommy. Uh, oh, the Longest Jard, Enter the Dragon, place. all oh, the Bruce Jesus. Lee movies. Let me tell you. Exorcist, I there, saw there. There were times when I think that the staff of that theater could have shut down and gone home for the day if I didn't show up with me and my buddies, you know, like me and a couple of guys, because we'd be the only people in the theater, you know? And, 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 and then the movie's done and we leave and everyone's standing. They're trying to go home. These poor folks got three, little, three, three white assholes sitting in the theater laughing their brains out when we could have gone home for the day. <laughs> I practically lived in that theater. I grew up in that. Th- I can't even. I look at movies now and I go, I, I saw that. The French Connection. I saw. Because my mom oh, yeah. had that bar there from 61. So, you know, from the time yeah. I could remember, she gave me a couple dollars and you walked to the cinema. The New Moon Chinese yeah. Restaurant, 
Pastor Music. I remember being in front of Pastor Music oh, and Pastor seeing Greg Allman walk sure. out with Cher. Are you fucking kidding me? In Union City, fucking right. New Jersey. My head almost fucking blew up. Uh, right. I love you, Ray, for calling right. in today. It made me happy and sad at the same time. You brought back great memories. And uh, just to know that we're still here. Well, that, carrying the fucking you know, torch kind of, at 38th Street. That was kind Street. of our childhood. You know, I mean, it was, there, there, there were good times and... And and there was tragedy too, you know. It was uh, it wasn't uh, it, 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 it but but you know what I mean. Looking back, it, it is it, it you can't you can't not look back and think about the harsh things that occurred. But uh, 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 there's a lot to there's a lot to be uh, happy about as well. I mean, we we were for a little while anyway. We were happy kids, and I think that we've come out the other end okay. Do you remember, do you remember when I don't know about you, but I'm all screwed up. Do you remember when Carmine <laughs> Balzano handcuffed Mr. Clemens? And beat him up on giving that terrorist, and he kept yelling police brutality. So he went from door to door, oh, yeah. telling people I to didn't sign see the, that. I saw it live, signed the petition. And you know, till this day, Michael Clemens won't friend me on Facebook because of uh, I wasn't I didn't cover for his dad that day. I saw Carmine throw a couple beatings down there that were mind boggling. <laughs> <laughs> when you're a child. Did I, I now? Did I hear correctly, or did did uh, 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 Mr. Balzano pass? No, Mr. Balzano is alive and kicking. I went out to dinner with him about a month and a half ago and it was uh, me him and me him and Pete went out to dinner. Why did I think he passed? Who, that, who, who, listen, who passed bro, away then? There's certain people in this life that are gonna die and there's certain people in life that aren't gonna die. They ain't gonna die. They're gonna be the last man standing. And I have a funny <laughs> feeling Carmine's gonna be one of those people, bro. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Why did I think that? My goodness me, how what an awful thought! No. I mean, he was just—I mean, the whole family was just great. We'd go swimming and hang out, and um, the house was always open. Uh, just uh, my brother and I both. What about when we were across uh, the street uh, and fucking the feds were over there because they were looking for the gun that Patty Hearst used in the fucking picture yeah. that you see it. Remember that shit? These, you know, yeah, uh, Ray. Yeah. I'm happy you fucking hey, called. Speaking, speaking of that crazy shit, I'm watching the Iceman right now. Oh, that's right. We were talking about that last night on the phone. Tell him how we grew up with prong. You had the pleasure of meeting the Iceman. Me, I never saw that motherfucker, I, but I knew who Mr. Prong was. I, I, yeah, you know, it's a little eerie um, <laughs> that this is all coming to light. But Coco and I. For, for you folks out there listening, uh, we we knew um, Mr. Softy. Mr. Softy was uh, a hitman uh, for the. I, well, he was kind of a uh, a freelance contractor. He worked for different crime families. He worked for the Gambinos and he, uh, and and a few others. And um, we knew him, you know, because of his kids. They lived in Charles Court. So we knew little Johnny Prange, and we knew, you know, we knew the family, but the father was, well, a sociopath. Uh, 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 now, Kuklinski, the Iceman, I met, uh, um, I met Richard Kuklinski and one of his daughters. Uh, my father had a retail store on Kennedy Boulevard, uptown in North Bergen. And, uh, you know, putting two and two together, I now realize that, Probably a, a decent amount of the goods that he sold in the retail store were were fenced, so <laughs> you know they kind of fell off the truck, and uh, that was that was Kuklinski. So one day um, I'm uh, I'm at the store with my father, and this enormous man comes through the door, long long winter coat, big guy, fur collar, big guy, and uh, a, a girl, a little girl. And they, you know, they shook hands. I was introduced. The guy's hand was like a, a, a catcher's mitt. Huge, huge man. I'll never forget. And they gave me like 10 bucks and told me and his daughter to go upstairs to the bowling alley and get a Coke. And so that's what we did. We went upstairs and we got a Coke and we sat and we talked while my father did business with Richard Kuklinski. But, um... Oy vey, Kuklinski left bodies all over our neighborhood. At the York Motel. You remember the, the York Street Motel, McKinley. right, Coco? He cut that body in half. We used to go over and get potato chips when we were kids from the he, fucking he, hotel lobby. The, the York Motel, which was only about 200 yards from my house, uh, was where one of Kuklinski's victims was found. Uh, he left, boy, uh, uh, um, 
uh, the the diner on Route 46. Um, he stuffed a guy in a barrel and left the barrel uh, uh, next to a dumpster on Route 46, and the barrel stayed there for like weeks. They think that he killed Steve Benavento's father too. They think he killed Steve Benavento's father, the gangster from West New York. They say that he killed Steve Benavento's father. Also. It's it's highly likely. It's highly, highly, highly likely. But, um, yeah, that was my one brush with uh, something that I, 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 you know, and it's funny, too, because I never forgot the man because he was so enormous. But uh, he died in jail, Kuklinski. And, um, and so I'm in the middle of watching the movie now. And it's just interesting because, you know, John Prange's dad drove a Mr. Forky <coughs> truck, and his method of execution was cyanide. So when you think about it, here's a guy handling cyanide and selling ice cream to kids at the same time. It was, uh, you know, that's pretty spooky. Let me tell you something. We grew up in an area that uh, I took Lee there, and we shot the Prongay's house, and we shot uh, Sabatino's house. And Like I said, right. I grew up in an area that made me and also broke me. It broke me and made me. It broke me as a kid. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, but uh, let me tell you something. I'm happy that you called, and I want you to do it again. we got to get the fuck out of here. This was the most interesting oh. call we've had in a long goddamn time. Uh, we went from death to <laughs> happiness to TV to the death of television to why you should fucking... To mafia. To mafia to why you should subscribe to Hulu Plus for seven ninety nine a month. <laughs> Raymond, I will give you a call later on, and we will have you back on here again. What's the name of your YouTube channel? Screenbox. Oh, Screen thank box. you so much, Coco. Thank, you know, thank you so much for everything. It's just Fuck, great to it's talk great to you. To know I you're still love alive to you know what I would love to do? If we could get Dean LaPreet or John Bender, the three of us on the phone together, that would just be great. I would really, really enjoy that. Well, let me talk but, to uh, Dean. Uh, um, See, he's shy. For anybody listening out there, the channel is called Screenbox, and I want you to go on YouTube, okay, and do a search for Screenbox. Look for me. I use a stage name. My stage name is Rayzilla. Uh, it's a nickname I developed while I was at Sci-Fi Channel. It was a nickname that I kind of that kind of got stuck on to me while I was at Sci-Fi. And I'm the host of the channel as well. So I want everybody out there to go to YouTube, search for Screenbox. The first two weeks are free. It's a two ninety nine per month subscription. Okay, so it's two ninety nine a month. It ain't gonna break your back. It ain't gonna break the bank like cable does um, and uh, the first two weeks are free and you go there and watch till your eyes bleed scream as much as you want so <laughs> Ray what what's a good movie or show or one of the videos to watch to like what's your favorite one or what's one people should watch to see if they're gonna like it I have two favorites actually I've two favorites that I really enjoy on the channel um, one is called dead and breakfast and it's a zombie musical, actually. Uh, I, I made it available. We made it available for free over the thanks uh, over the uh, Christmas holiday uh, because we wanted to position it as sort of like the sound of music, only with a lot more blood. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, cause you get burnt out on all the holiday stuff. But uh, uh, Dead and Breakfast, which is a wonderful zombie musical, is a great movie. And the second one I really enjoy, and is a film that you should all check out, it's called God of Vampires. And it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, a tw it, it's not a twist, but it puts a spotlight on the Chinese version of the vampire, what's known as the Cheng Shi. Uh, they are blind corpse vampires, zombie vampires, so they're actually flesh eaters as well. Uh, and that's one of the things that you're going to find at Screenbox is that uh, the United States is not the beginning, middle, and end of horror films, that there's horror films from around the world. And uh, that's the type of material that we want to present on Screenbox, is international horror as well as U.S. domestic. So check out those two movies, God of Vampires and Dead and Breakfast. And do you have, I, I just, because it's so new, do you have like, because like us, we do the show every Monday and Wednesday, does Screenbox have every Monday or once a month you put a new thing on there, or, or does it come as it comes, or how does that work? Well, uh, we present a new film. We unlock a new film every week okay. on the channel. So, so when you come to the channel 
and you click on there, there's going to, every week there's going to be a brand new film. Besides the 200 other movies that are there on the channel, every week is going to be something new. Also, as the host, I do movie reviews. I go to the theater and I do reviews of big theatricals. I also travel around the state uh, to horror conventions and I shoot little packages and I, I just uploaded a, a package from a, a horror convention in Atlantic City called uh, Bazaar AC. I went down there for a day and hung out with my people, uh, <laughs> the great unwashed, as I like to call them. Uh, uh, and so I'm out and around creating original content for the channel as well. So you can watch movies or you can watch me being an idiot. So that, that's crazy. For three bucks a month, you get at least minimum four movies. You're, le you're less expensive than Redbox. That's pretty... That's pretty crazy. And if you're in the it's, hot, if you're it's in the less than it's, 50, it's less than fifty bucks a year. It's it's entertainment a la carte, which is what the public has wanted for decades. <sighs> the public has wanted entertainment. They don't want the public does not want all of these cable channels that they're not watching. If the public had the choice, they would prefer to choose what channels they want to watch as opposed to just having to accept everything. So it's entertainment a la carte horror movies the way you're supposed to watch them well that's awesome anyone anyone watching should put in the comments that you heard him on on here just so he knows and that's crazy i'm gonna show my girlfriend this weekend she loves she loves horror so you probably just made my weekend a whole bunch of horror there's and and there's a lot i just returned from a, a film market in santa monica uh back in november and uh, closed a few deals, so there are more movies coming. There's always the, the fun part about joining Screenbox right now is that you're going to get an opportunity to watch us grow, and it's the early days that are sometimes the most fun because we will experiment a little more. You know, when you're fresh out of the gate, uh, that's where that's where a lot of the fun is. So you know, join if you join Screenbox now, we're only going to get bigger, and uh, and you get to watch that, and you get to come along for the ride. I love you, buddy. Stay blacker than I, black. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Because you got no reason to lie, cocksucker. I love you. Have a great weekend. <laughs> hey, Happy fun will not. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you said to me last night. I love you, dude. I love you, brother. Thank you. That was a fun podcast. Hey, let's do this again, all right? Anytime, brother. Just let me know when you want to call. All right. Take care, dude. Thank you so much for the great questions uh, on Screenbox. You no go. problem, man. Thank you. All right, brother. All right. Be well. You too. What do you think of that, Lee? That was your it's favorite. Was it's a good, uh, he's a good dude. Bro. Yeah, it's good. It's crazy because I I know there's so many people, especially in TV, who are his age and refuse to do anything different. Nothing. Nothing. So it's uh, I can't imagine because I, I I was thinking oh maybe they have the movies on there and once every few months they add a new one. If they're adding four movies a month for three bucks, I mean that's. That's your next venture, Lee. While he was talking, I was thinking, this is your next thing. You like all this shit. I was very surprised how you acted at the grudge match premiere. You like film. I, I mean, I you love like movies, film. yeah. You like film. You yeah. Gotta, you got to get it together, Lee. You're slipping. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is the shit. Dollar ninety nine a month, Lee's favorites. You get porno on there. A couple people getting killed, some horror. Yeah, the the issue is the, the licensing for what they have. But, I mean, that's... that's uh, I, I didn't even know YouTube had stuff like that. I didn't. I didn't know I they heard had about subscription it, yeah. services. And they got original program. I'm gonna give some shout outs real quick. I'm Go for it. Slay Goth, you bad motherfucker. Pamela, I love you. Sheila in Boston, training motherfuckers up there. Superhuman DG, Zachary Holstein, Kevin Munoz, Mister Spacely. Get well, cocksucker. Stop eating those Vikings. Westport 115, Daniel Hodson, and Constantine, you bad motherfucker over there, letting bitches know. What's cracker lacking? Uh, you know, you my guys might think this. We set this up. We didn't set this up this way. Hulu Plus, bitches, seven ninety nine a fucking month. How many times I gotta tell you? It's two weeks for free. Boom, on the fucking cuff until you decide if it's even worth it. And after the conversation today, you should be running to fucking Hulu Plus. What are they pressing the box? Joey. Joey. So go to joeydiaz.net, look at the tour schedule, and at the same fucking time, bam, right in the box. And while you're at it, we talked about it yesterday. That's what got me going last night, to be honest with you, was that fucking uh, nature shroom box? tech. Oh, oh, shroom okay. tech. I'm out of nature box. The last thing I ate was that fucking <laughs> acai uh, uh, granola. That's delicious. Yeah. You try that yeah. shit. We'll get on nature box next. Fucking go to honor.com. I'm telling you right now, I'm 50 years old last night. 
My endurance is growing. It's, I'm still a fat fuck, but I'm out there. And that's the most important thing. All right, you're out there. That's it. You're, you got to get out there. Number three, nature's box. I'm more fucking impressed with this than ever before. 50% off. It's nutritionalist approved. Like Lee said, it's better than bringing fucking Kit Kats or to be going back and forth to the fucking uh, thing to eat fucking chocolate or potato chips. Get the cocoa almonds. Get the fucking pumpkin seeds with the salt. Go to joeydiaz.net. Go to the box. 50% off. What are they pressing? Joey. Who, who's better than you, Lee Cox? No one. Pretty soon, your own show, they'll be going and saying, who do you press? Lee Syatt or the flying fucking Jew. Or That's what I'm talking Jew. about. Yeah. You're looking handsome today with that I'm shirt trying. with stripes. You bad motherfucker, you. And finally, last but not least, Buffalo, New York. Listen, I'm coming in like a fucking big black kahuna. So get your shit together. Let's warm up. Bring reefer. Bring that powder down from fucking Canada. I don't give a fuck. Just get there, cocksucker. Bring the dog sled. That's what you people are known for. The week after that, I'm at the Melrose Improv. My main man, Lisa, is going to be down there giving out autographs and slinging dick as usual. And fucking the House of Comedy up there in the Mall of America, the 24th to the 26th. We got a live podcast on the 30th. We're not fucking stopping this month. I'm shooting Marin this month. Oh, shit. Yeah, we ain't fucking around this month, Lee. We're yeah. building the fucking podcast castle, our own fucking... We're setting our marker and enforcing it, Lee. <laughs> That's it. It's time. Lee. I love I'm it. sick and fucking tired. And you're going to open up your own fucking video page, too, cocksucker. Going to do Don't it. Don't make me go over there and burn you with this e-cigarette. <laughs> I'm in the mood tonight. <laughs> and everyone, please go check out Flying Jew Radio. We did a great one yesterday with Agostino. That's new. We put one up every week. Um, and then also, next week, uh, they're do uh, Jill Himitsu is doing an Inspired Disorder 24-hour podcast. And I talked to her last night. I'm going to do... I don't know how long I'm going to be on there, but I'm, I'm auctioning off to support Yuck Nasty. Uh, either a call-in to Flying Jew Radio, you can talk about whatever you want, and I'm also going to do, because I always get calls, how do I start a podcast, how do, if you want, call in, we're supporting Yuck Nasty, I'm not taking any of the money, going to donate the highest bidder, if you want to do a, a Skype with me and how to set up a podcast and how to do the Skype. How about the fucking Skype. auctioning off your underwear? If you consider that this women league. If people want my underwear, let's fucking do it. Let's do it, anything bitch. Anything for yuck nasty. Let's do it. And a good pair of underwear. You got to walk around the block a couple times. A that's a bad ball, pair of underwear. A little muffler sniff. That's what people want. There's a chick that she gets thirty dollars for socks. <laughs> for socks. Can you imagine what you got for your underwears for sniffing them? Fucking raffle it off, Lee. Yeah. Right now, put it down. put it out there. <laughs> Lee, I ask him to raffle off a pair of underwear. Look at him; he's getting all hot under the collar. No, fuck it, I'll do it. Some it, women will smell want, that fucking. Anyone, that anything to get him back in the house? Can and you? They wear it on their face like musk. It's all over. You oh, know I can't saying? imagine losing a house. <laughs> That's so funny. But anyways, it's next Tuesday and Wednesday. I think just go to Jill Himitsu's page. And we're doing this. We're doing this. We got to help out Yuck Nasty. <laughs> he's part of the fucking network. <laughs> Every three weeks, uh, what good is being part of something if we don't all fucking chip in? Like I said, I don't know how many fucking downloads we get a month. I don't know how to break it up, but we'll all chip in a dollar to Yuck Nasty. This will all make it fucking better. Listen, man, this is the first week of the year. I hope you guys are focused and ready for what's coming up. God knows what's going to happen. We just want to be healthy and fucking strong this year. Lee's making some fucking leaps and bounds. I, I saw him yesterday doing jumping jacks with, fucking, with spats on and shit. What's going on, Cocksucker, with you? Nothing. Just I, I was really happy yesterday with Flying Jew Radio because it takes a while. Like you, you remember rhythm. when we get in a rhythm, but we got a few great calls yesterday, and we were talking about uh, just just stuff that's going on, and just I want to I want to I always get revved up in the mornings with this. I want to call Ray Cannell and do a podcast with him, or I don't know what, but it's uh, that's it, it's it, that that whole conversation really. At least I know someone's working on it. It's so a whole uh, new fucking year, bro. It's yeah. a whole new set of rules, brother. Yep. And, uh, and uh, you got to grow and you got to roll with the punches as much as you don't like it sometimes. And that's what's going on with television. Yeah. We've seen it with the show. We've seen it with the podcast. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, this is a show. We didn't. This is just us being ourselves. And we have an internet presence. So uh, this is where it's going. And I enjoy doing it. I enjoy being freely. You know, I went to a meeting Monday that was horrific. Yeah, Monday, I can't imagine. Monday, yesterday, yesterday, that in Hollywood, that was just horrific on their thoughts of podcasting in the future. And I sit there, and you know, Lee, on the way up Laurel Canyon, I got sick. I called you, and I said I didn't feel good. You know what makes us a fucking an authority that we're doing it mm -hmm. on the way up? I was like, you know what? Whenever I lead these things, I always feel like a fucking asshole because I always look down at the people in a way like, who the fuck are they? to judge us or to say that they want to do a podcast and make me a, a they, these people were offering me like a, a section on the podcast, but they wanted me to keep it a little cleaner. 
And I left there, and they're turning something simple, like television. Everybody always wants to turn something simple into something so fucking hard. You know what, Lee? I don't have a format for this show, nor do I, am I interested in having one. If we play a song one day, and if we don't play a song the next way, if we have a call one day, if we don't, we're giving you entertainment, or what we consider something that's worthwhile for you to listen to. I see what's on TV. I said the fucking talk shows. It's a bunch of people talking about promoting fucking a movie. I don't give a fuck about that shit. I want to know what makes you fucking tick. Yeah. And that's why we've been successful. We get on here. I don't write fucking jokes. As we're talking them, if they come out, they come out. If not, fuck it. That's what happens. You know what I'm saying? We're getting high. We're having a good time. And we're just being us. And that's what people want to see. Most people. I want to see that. And I've been yearning for that for years. I've been yearning for that for years. It's like when you look at People Magazine and you see George Clooney yucking it up with fucking Brad Pitt. That's not really. They're on a movie set. The people with cameras there. You know what I'm saying? What happens in real life? Yeah. That's what we've given you. I don't fucking polish these stories up. I just come up with fucking names and who our sponsors are and the dates. There's no fucking material here. What the fuck? This just goes as it goes. And uh, that's why it's successful, and that's why we have the fucking people we have. And that's why, uh, who the fuck knows, Lee? I can't, I gotta stop smoking dope. In the morning, you know <laughs> I love you guys. Either I see you in Buffalo this week, or I'll see you in fucking uh, Melrose the week after, or I'll see you in, Pat in uh, Minneapolis. MB girl. And belief, I see you, sexy motherfucker. Beside that, stay black. Have a great day. And uh, tell Joel Osteen, whatever. <laughs> now that the show's over, don't forget to sign up for your free trial of Hulu Plus. Hulu Plus lets you binge on thousands of hit shows anytime, anywhere on your TV, PC, smartphone, or tablet. Support this podcast and get an extended free trial of Hulu Plus when you go to HuluPlus.com slash Joey or go to JoeyDiaz.net and click on the Hulu Plus banner. And also, now that the show's over, remember to sign up uh, at naturebox.com. Order great-tasting, healthy snacks at 50% off. Snack smarter in the new year with healthy and delicious treats like French toast granola. Support this podcast and get 50% off of your first order. Go to naturebox.com and use promo code Joey. That's naturebox.com, promo code Joey. <laughs>